Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Gut Reset Summit. I'm your host, Dr. John Dempster, and today I'm thrilled to introduce to you Stephen Wright. And Stephen Wright, he is a health engineer, a Kalish Functional Medicine Institute graduate, and a gut health specialist. And he spent close to $400,000 overcoming his own gut health challenges and overall health challenges using everything from Western medicine to shamans. And Stephen, as a result, is the founder of thehealthygut.com. And he lives in Boulder, Colorado with his wife, Shay, and their two dogs. So Stephen, great to have you on the Gut Reset Summit. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And look, I know I've got so much to talk to you about today and ask you, but I, I want to hear a little bit about your story. What what went on to bring you to this place to be the founder of this great website, healthygut.com? And, you know, tell, tell us uh, what went on there. Yeah, I mean, it's a very similar story arc as many people in this industry, which is that, you know, I have my own problems. Uh, they started for me at birth. Um, I had a birth defect that caused some intestinal issues and I almost didn't make it. Western medicine and their anti-spermatics and their formula saved my life, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but I've had I've had gut issues my my entire life, literally from birth. And as we all know, as you peel back the layers, you you know, you might start with a complaint like mine when you fast forward in my life and I'm eating salads and chicken or I'm eating burgers and beer and I'm having such bad bloating and gas that I literally cry after every meal. And it doesn't matter if I, you know, try my hardest or if I just give up and throw my hands up and eat deep dish pizza. It's the same outcome, which is extreme uh, visceral hypersensitivity. It's a type of IBS where you feel like literally knives are in your gut. And then if you've ever been in that position, you really don't have any options. You have to fart. Like, <laughs> like if you want the pain to go away, you've got to get the pressure off the nerves. And so uh, unfortunately for me at the time, I was working 16 stories up in Chicago and there was only like one bathroom on the floor. And so you can't like run outside. You can't go to your car. You can't work from home back then. And uh, so anyways, my coworkers uh, reported me to the boss as they should have, because I was probably really stinky. And um, he had a little talk with me and said, look, man, you got to get this handled. And so for me, there was a ton of really embarrassing stories and, and I'd already been, aware that I was gassy and, and and had IBS for years, but that was kind of like the, the four by four to the face for me that had me go seek help. <laughs> and, uh, and I saw, I saw it multiple doctors in Chicago, like top of the top at the time. And luckily they were actually decent. They checked me for celiac disease. I didn't have it. Um, they did a number of other tests and they're like, look, man, you have a, you have IBS. Congratulations. Here's some antibiotics. You should take Metamucil and, and you should eat whole grains. And I'd already, you know, had a bunch of antibiotics and had a bunch of issues and passed out from too many antibiotics and all kinds of things. And so I just kind of left there distraught. Like my entire life is written for me. I have this, this thing, who's going to, you know, who's going to marry me? How am I going to keep a job? What is going on? Um, this is so embarrassing. And I think from that rage, that shame, that anger kind of had me seek other ideas. And luckily I had a great friend in college, Jordan, who was having similar struggles with the gluten-free diet. And he was like, Hey, there's this you know, these other diets out there at the time, a specific carbohydrate diet. And that was like a huge break point for me. Cause about seven days into that 50% of my pain was gone. And that just lit a fuse that like, I have way more control over my body than I thought. And no one knows me better than me. And so all these experts, these, these doctors, three of them so far, um, have done nothing but let me down. So all I got to do is find people like me and just reverse engineer and try what they tried. And some of it's got to work and I can figure this out. And so that, um, if you have a psychology like mine, where you just can't stop pulling on the string, <laughs> that'll lead to another, you know, 14, 15 years of explorations around, you know, why, like, I don't, I don't subscribe to the idea of trying to uh, live in a bubble with like no Wi-Fi and no blue light and, and, and no gluten and no, no wine. Um, I try to minimize those things, but um, I will have been asking the question since I realized dairy was an issue, like, why can't I have dairy and when can I have it again? And so, yeah, many years and, and many root causes later, here we are. What were you officially diagnosed with after all that? Just IBSM, uh, you know, alternating IBS mm -hmm. uh, with visceral hypersensitivity. Okay. Well, listen, I know that is a very short uh, summary of your journey, but uh, you know, part of that journey and part of what we're going to talk about today is about this term we hear a lot about is leaky gut. 
but not only about leaky gut, we're going to talk about, you know, what are some of the biggest mistakes people are making? I think this is so important because I have so many patients that come to me that say, I have leaky gut. There's presumptions that are made. Um, sometimes they're correct. Sometimes it might not be correct, but also the people have tried so many things usually at that point, some have made them worse uh, and some have, you know, fortunately helped them along the way, but I'd love to hear from you, you know, what's going on here, maybe high level, we've got a bunch of, uh, you know, questions to dive into, but why are people making these, these mistakes with, with leaky gut right now? Well, I mean, partially I'm to blame for that. I mean, for a little while, uh, my article was number one on Google since the first article I wrote about leaky gut was in 2012. And uh, we had one of the first courses on leaky gut back in the day. And so I'm partially to blame for that. And then I think a lot of other people have just failed to update their reference points on, on the new literature that's been coming out. And so um, sadly, the natural health world and the alternative health world is like so beautiful in many things, but it's just as dogmatic as the Western world. And it, it's it's really sad because a lot of people think they're being anti-dogmatic, but then they become so dogmatic that they don't update their models when new science and new products make themselves available. And so um, I would say right now, one of the mistakes I put out there, and, it, and it, it wasn't a mistake at the time, we just didn't have the data, but now we have the data, which is that we should be really focused on these things called tight, tight junctions, that these are the, the rubber bands that keep the gut cells together, and uh, they get lax, and then we get this leaky gut syndrome, and then that perpetuates inflammation and food sensitivities, and of course is is linked to almost every autoimmune condition that's ever been studied, and all kinds of other you know host of issues. And so um, there has been an entire ten years of focus on these tight junctions. Meanwhile, science has sped on by and revealed that there's. Uh, I believe at least five layers with the the physical layer, the tight junctions um, and the mucous membrane being just one of the layers that causes leaky gut. And so if we just focus in on um, tight junction uh, testing, tight junction protection, tight junction regeneration, uh, we're missing these other four layers. And, you know, again, we could be just throwing a dart into the ocean trying to figure this out when there's so much more possibility for healing for people who are in these stuck conditions. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because the testing that is available can sometimes hit the nail on the head. But I, I find oftentimes, you know, we have to take that further because leaky gut is a syndrome. It's not a disease. There's not any pathognomonic one marker that we're going to find that signifies if you have it. But as you say, you know, even the testing that's currently available, and I'd love to hear a little bit more uh, how you're analyzing and, and uh, coming up with uh, leaky gut as a diagnosis for people, if, if you are, uh, how you're coming to coming to that point, because the testing is limiting. Uh, I do think that better testing is probably going to come down the pipes, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. What, how do you come, you know, what are these five layers? Let's maybe dive into that first. Yeah. So I think, well, just to highlight what you said, like leaky gut is not a, a disease. It's a state. It's a state of the body or the state of the gut. And so I think that makes it really complex to test for. And so you can, you can monitor a ton of variables and you want to see progress in all those variables. And that should indicate along with, symptom reduction that the healing is taking place. But this idea that there's one test like the lactulose mannitol test or a zonulin uh, blood marker is like the way to measure this. And, and if you get a positive result and then you get a negative result, like suddenly you're healed. Well, if you can't, if you still have a bunch of food sensitivities, if you're still having brain issues, skin reactions, if, um, you know, if you have to live in a bubble from mold and all these different things, like then you, you haven't handled it. Your gut is not resilient enough in that that state of the gut it's not actually healed despite a test showing that um you've improved right so you're you're following it more on a symptomology basis and and seeing how people are healing at that point is that right well it's both and so let me go back to the five layers and then i'll, I'll tell you why i find uh it, it has to be both and so um so in my new model and i haven't coined a name if I could trademark it, you know, maybe one day that would make me a lot of money or something. But as far as I know, this has never been taught anywhere else. This is uh, probably the second time I've only publicly mentioned this at this point. Um, but basically, uh, Alessio Fasano did some amazing work on zonulin and gliadin and wheat, and that was the basis of, of leaky gut syndrome, you know, a decade ago. Now we know that, um, for instance, our really, really sensitive gut cells, just like our, our skin cells, 
uh, you would never want them exposed to the outside world on a regular basis. Like it would be mm. our skin's seven layers deep. Our, our gut's only one layer deep. We would want to protect that, right? We'd have layers of protection, just like uh, any sort of defensible condition in the world. Like if you had a castle back in the day, you'd have like a moat and a drawbridge and, you know, some archer, like you'd have these layers of defense and the gut is similar. And so in the gut, we start with the atmosphere. So the gut actually needs to be a low oxygen atmosphere. And unfortunately, if we do antibiotics, if we do elimination diets too long, um, we increase the oxygen uh the oxygen concentration, which which causes it to be aerobic. But the bacteria that we want to live inside of our gut are anaerobes. They are without oxygen. They thrive without oxygen. And so the first layer of defense is really the, the atmosphere inside of our gut. If we lose our low oxygen atmosphere and the species and the metabolism that keeps it there, um, then we set up a, a whole host of issues that begin to, to go away. And, and some of those issues are we lose that microbiome diversity and thickness. So we start to get dysbiotic guts. You can measure that with stool tests. You can, you know, there's lots of ways to kind of see if you have dysbiosis. You can also just uh, have symptomology around uh, inability to, to digest things and, and have a whole list, whole list of uh, gut conditions. But then we also lose um, our capacity to generate things called defensins. Uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase is the most uh, known. And basically IAP, uh, basically grabs onto LPS. A lot of people will probably hear about LPS in the summit. LPS are very toxic. You cannot get away from them. They are part of daily life, but we have a defense network. And, and IAP is one of the best ways that we protect ourselves from these LPS molecules. And so if we lose our IAP production, which is a is produced from the gut immune connection, if that disruption gets out of whack, we stop producing it. And so, or we run out of uh, the ability. So that's also including secretory IgA, which is also a measurable component you can find to check out, are you producing too much, too little, uh, just the right amount, that kind of thing. So those are the defensins. We have the microbiome, and then we have our physical layer, which is mucus thickness and capacity, as well as our tight junctions. And then below that is the GALT, so the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And mostly there, I focus on the dendritic cells and the mast cells. So people who have histamine reactions and uh, MCAS, or, or mast cell activation syndrome, these folks have lost all those layers such that now regular compounds like strawberries and salmon and just normal non-inflammatory foods now cause them to feel in inflammation and feel you know all the, the symptoms of high histamine. And so we can focus all we want on the mast cells, but until we rebuild the entire layer, all these all these resiliency layers, the, the MCAS and the histamine reactions are always going to kind of be just underneath the surface. And so I think this model of, of leaky gut would be really hard to measure if you were not able to check each one of those five layers and find out the health or ill health of each layer. Oh, I fully agree. I think that's uh, really wise what you just said. I mean, this is huge. And, you know, the amount of times we see people that present so differently than others, and yet the test results are showing, you know, rel relatively similar things. It, you just can't cookie cutter this. You've got to really start to nuance this a bit more, but I know you've got a model that works for a large amount of people here and I want to get into it, but you mentioned something earlier about this low oxygen, uh, you know, environment that we need. Tell us about this molecule. I think this is something that uh, you can expand upon that, but there's a low oxygen molecule molecule that can be really helpful to correct these sort of like stuck gut uh, cases in a way. What would that be? Yeah. So the, the special molecule is called butyrate and butyrate is a it's the, the most beneficial short chain fatty acid. Short chain fatty acids are made by our healthy microbiome. And um, 70 to 80% of the metabolism in our colonocytes, the cells in our gut, are supposed to come from butyrate uh, metabolism. And so basically the, the microbiome uh, gets prebiotics, it gets fibers, it it creates these short chain fatty acids. The the biggest amount is butyrate. The butyrate is sucked up along with oxygen into the colonocytes, and so they, when they're doing metabolism that way, uh, they keep it in a low oxygen state. Um, also, the microbiome that grows in that that state will also consume some of the oxygen. If you take antibiotics, if you go on elimination diets such as the FODMAP 
uh, diet for too long, or even the specific carbohydrate diet, which I mentioned earlier for too long, any of these diets for too long, you will cause a sort of elimination dysbiosis and a reduction in butyrate production. And then they're going to cause these cells to flip back to like a glucose metabolism or some other metabolism pathway that won't consume as much oxygen. And so over and over, everywhere I've looked over the last few years for butyrate metabolism and butyrate production, you basically can find a connection to all five layers and all the issues that are going on. So if you want to restore a uh, a microbiome, if you want like a healthy, thick microbiome, if you want to restore uh, food sensitivities, get rid of them. I mean, um, if you want to restore a leaky gut, you have to have butyrate. It is the key. It's a linchpin to a resilient gut. And without it, it and I think this is why we had so many stuck guts and why we have um, so many people who are still, you know, this is maybe their fifth or sixth summit on the gut. It's because if you just add probiotics, if you just add leaky gut powders and L-glutamines and prebiotics, you don't focus in on that butyrate pathway. You're kind of like missing, you're missing the boat here and you're always going to be uh, kind of getting better, but not really getting better. You find it's enough to support the butyrate pathways, you know, naturally, like through fibers and certain probiotics, of course, but do you find it more effective to actually supplement the butyrate itself? So what I've seen over the last three years is without a doubt, if you're like a mild case, so mild case, meaning like you can just eliminate a few, few, few foods and you're like feeling much better. Like you might not need to supplement with, with butyrate, but if you're a tough case like myself and like most people watching this summit, you're going to need to supplement with a, with an advanced butyrate for a while, somewhere between three to nine months or more to basically restore the ecology of the gut and allow you to tolerate the prebiotics and the fibers that would normally be able to be digested and broken down and utilized by the microbiome. So, so a lot of people, including myself, when we're in pain or, or we're frustrated, we want results right away, but we, we have to really think about the fact that we're using supplemental butyrate to restart metabolism. We're increasing mucus uh, thickness and uh, sensitivity. We're improving tight junctions. We are increasing microbiome diversity. Uh, you increase secretory IgA and IAP production, and you lower the oxygen concentration, all from supplemental butyrate. Now, not all supplemental butyrates, which we can go into, but um, with the right supplemental butyrates, you can do all five of the layers for a while, but it doesn't happen overnight. And it's not like the only thing in the arsenal to fixing a leaky gut syndrome or leaky gut plus histamine and plus autoimmune and plus all these other things. So what's the best form? What's the best type of butyrate? Yeah. So uh, version one of butyrates were sodium butyrates and calmag butyrates, and they have good data on them in humans and they, they did well, but they just didn't, uh, they didn't do as well as they could have for a lot of folks and, and me included. Um, and there's some toxicity related issues around high sodium and the fact that we can't uh, get the sodium deeper into the gut, which is we want to coat the entire gut in butyrate if possible. And so luckily in the last like four to five years, the scientists have figured out how to bind it with fat. So tributyrin is the next generation molecule. And so you want to use a tributyrin based supplement which will be naturally time released because it needs a little lipase. So it actually will coat deeper in the gut just based on the fact that it's not a sodium or a Calmag version. Um, so tributyrin, and then if possible, you need to protect it from stomach acid. Uh, so, you know, at Healthy Gut, we've developed a supplement that has an, a true enteric soft gel um, that we, it's a patent pending soft gel out of Europe that we were able to license with 99.9% .9 purity tributyrin. So I, I still believe we're the only people on the market that have a true enteric coating. And there's other people out there who have gastro resistant coating. So like, for instance, I would say the best second product in the market would be sun butyrate from pure encapsulations. They've created a liposomal uh, protection mechanism that about like supposedly 80 to 90% of that molecule makes it through, through the stomach. And so um, basically you want to protect it and you want it to be tributyrin. And with those two things considered, most people, including like a lot of people that switch into our company's product, will say like, wow, I knew about butyrates. I tried sodium butyrate. It helped a little, but this is a totally different ballgame. 
Oh, that's that's huge. This is you're dropping fire right now, Stephen. I love it. Um, <laughs> but I do want to reinforce though, like you're so bang on about butyrate. You know, I know you do some testing, but we we test a lot of our patients their their short chain fatty acids, which but, butyrate is. And it's surprisingly, it's so low in so many of these patients. So like, even if you don't have the opportunity to do testing, you're only going to benefit by taking this by the sounds of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, if you have symptoms, you would classify as IBS or leaky gut it, or your practitioner does, you would be well served to give it a shot. It's, it's kind of, uh, again, it is the keeper of the gut. Like if vitamin D is sort of the keeper of your immune system, we've learned a lot about that in the last few years, I would say butyrate is the keeper of the gut. And so anybody who's struggling with any type of gut condition can see benefit from bringing it in during any type of protocol, whether it's whether you're in the pre-phase, the killing phase, the recovery phase, like no matter the protocol phase you're in, uh, the butyrate molecule is so interlinked to everything that's going on um, it, it's just imperative. And if, and if you're like, Hey, I don't have the money. I don't want to do that. Then you have to eat a ton of vegetables and you've, and hopefully have some starch in your diet, which I know is a little controversial. Yeah, you know, it, it is for sure. And it works for some people and others. You'd have to listen to how your body responds, but, uh, this is, that's really, really powerful information. All right. Back to these, uh, you know, top healing, uh, or excuse me, leaky gut uh, mistakes that we're making. Another big topic we hear about are which probiotics to take. Do I need probiotics? Isn't everyone supposed to be on probiotics with leaky gut? What's going on there? Yeah. So look, probiotics have come a long way in the last two decades full of research. Um, and what we've learned is that they're not a panacea, despite the fact that their popularity continues to grow. And now like even uh, people who are not in alternative medicine or functional medicine know about this stuff. Um, if if probiotics were the answer, we wouldn't need a summit. I wouldn't be talking because we would have figured this out. Like uh, mm. you and I have known about probiotics for probably 20 years. Like it's not, they're not a new thing. And if they were the answer, they would have already answered the call and they didn't. So what we're learning from the science is that every probiotic um, has a dosage and a strain and then a benefit. And so there are certain probiotics that are great for, for instance, uh, like megaspores, great for increasing acromancia and mucosal thickness, which is part of the layers of leaky gut, right? And that will also help block LPS in some ways. But it's they're very specific in how they uh, attach or don't attach and how they affect things. And so if you have a condition where you're like, hey, I have a, I have a skin issue, or I have a performance issue, there are probiotics that are studied for that. If you can get those dosages, they're great. But in general, the issue with probiotics is that um, if they are alive, which a lot of people are really worried about if they're alive or not, they can also cause your immune system to have further dysfunction and further reaction because they're more of the last components. I, I think of it like, like if you're doing a home remodel, probiotics are kind of like you know doing the interior design at the end. Like they're really great for modifying long-term health. Uh, there's brain-related probiotics. There's gut-related ones. There's skin. There's there's all kinds of cool stuff. There's going to be weight loss ones. Um, but there, you want to fine-tune it for your style and what you're focused on, rather than using them up front when you're, you know, if you're you got a leaky roof, if you put a new coat of paint on, um, it's not really getting the job done. And so I think there's there's two things there. One is that a lot of people are actually reacting to the probiotics because their gut is so dysfunctional and it's so broken down that it's too early to bring them in. And so they're they're convinced in their head because of their doctor or a summit or a article online, they need to be on this product because it's so beneficial when their body's not ready for it. Um, and then the other thing is that they're using the wrong types. So what are the types that uh, you're totally reading my mind here? I, I wanted to find out what are the wrong types and then what are the right types of probiotics that we should be looking at? So the, the wrong types are the ones that do not list the strain and an individual amount on the back of the bottle. So you flip that over and it just says uh, uh, lactobacillus acidophilus, nothing, or bifidobacteria bereave, nothing. Then you know that that manufacturer is either buying a insuffer, in, uh, insufficient like type or like a cheaper version of that probiotic. They don't know what it does, um, and they don't know the the amount. And so you want them to have the strain. So that's usually like numbers and letters, like um, LGG, so lacto 
uh, Bacillus rhamnosus GG is one of my favorites. It's one of the best well-studied strains out there. Um, so you want to see that GG or you want to see like 0195. That's a, a, another strain that's really good for constipation. Um, so th these specific types of strains. And so you want to Google that. You grab that strain and that name and Google that plus whatever you're working on. It could be uh, leaky gut. It could be constipation. It could be hair growth, whatever it is. See if there's any papers on that. If there's not, then it's not probably the right strain for you. Um, so the, the, the powders that have like 14 different strains and 100 billion or 300 billion, that version of building a probiotic powder is typically not going to help you. It could be harming you. Um, in general, because if that was the way we would have stopped there, we would have had a scene, a, a big recur or a big, um, uh, we've got, we would have gotten rid of IBS, I guess, basically based on the marketing I see out there, but we, but we didn't. Um, and so you got to be very specific with which ones you're bringing into your body and which ones you're bringing in at what time period. And then also there's these new ones that are dead that work really well for the immune system. And so uh, they're called paraprobiotics and they're literally the dead version of the beneficial alive version. And what they're finding out is that these bugs are so, so specific, like a, a live version of a certain bug. I actually read this research paper last week will help you gain muscle, but the dead version will not help you gain muscle, but it will reduce your inflammation. Like that's crazy. That yeah. Same dosage, two different groups of humans. We're not talking about rat studies. We're talking about human studies. That's crazy. So just for everyone listening, and again, just to clarify, these are the para probiotics that they should be looking for. Can you just clarify that? Well, para probiotics are very helpful for certain stages of healing. So if you have an immune dysregulation, that I would classify that as uh, histamine reactions, um, obviously autoimmune related reactions, but also a lot of people don't think about skin and brain function. Those are, you know, typically uh, our gut propagated propagate signals. A lot of times they're cytokines, which a lot of people have heard of now. Um, and these signals come out of the, the gut from the immune system, from the dendritic cells down there, and they end up wherever we might have genetic weak points. So some of us might have a family history of brain related things, or in mine, we have asthma and heart conditions. Um, so it, it can propagate out and you can use dead probiotics or paraprobiotics to basically calm down Th1 and Th2 imbalances or excessive IgE formation, which is really important for those folks who are struggling with food intolerances and can't figure out how to get back to eating, you know, FODMAPs and all different types of dietary components that would be helpful to create the butyrate we mentioned a little while ago. And so I believe paraprobiotics can come in during the um, during the phases when you're really uh activated or acutely sick and, and struggling because they're dead. They will not activate the immune system the wrong way. They're safer in that, in that mechanism. Um, and then as you sort of retrain the immune system, then you can phase those out to probiotics to complete the last steps of your healing pathway, wherever you're trying to go. That makes sense. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, you, you also triggered my, uh, you know, my, my brain here for a second here. What are, we hear a lot about these powders that everyone should take and, you know, there's all sorts of them on the market. What's some of the myths and mistakes we are making with these leaky gut powders that are out there? Yeah. So, I mean, look, I want health to be easy and simple. I want like life to be easy and simple, but it pretty much never is when we're dealing with, with alive beings. And so, Leaky gut powders were developed in the thousands or so for, for the last 15 years. And they were our best attempt at the time to try to put all the nutrients we thought were important to healing a leaky gut into one location and one easy scoop. That way it's like one easy scoop a day. It's your, your leaky gut multivitamin or something like that. And I'm sure hopefully one of these things will hit the pathway that you're disrupted in. Unfortunately, the majority of those powders are made up of a, of a few classifications of ingredients. They're typically uh, like sort of some sort of nutrient like uh, zinc or L-glutamine. And then they're usually some herbs that produce more mucus and more mucus health. And beyond that, there's not a lot in there. Like if you were to classify the mechanisms of action 
of these powders, the majority of them are missing nutrients, which is totally true. If you have low vitamin D status or low vitamin A status or a, uh, a low L-glutamine status, your gut health, like your capacity to make gut cells and, and zonulin in the tight junctions will be decreased. Studies have proven that. And so if you had low nutrient status in those areas, that powder might help as soon as you like replenish that store though, like as soon as you got your zinc up, then it's not going to do anything else to any of those other layers. And then the same thing is true for some of the healing herbs, um, you know, like aloe vera and, uh, you know, even DGL and I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Um, but most of those other herbs are in this sort of uh, Ayurvedic and or uh, mucosal healing pathway, which again, soothing, helpful for strengthening the mucosal pathways, but that's only one layer of the five layers we talked about. It's not going to do anything for your butyrate production. It's not going to do anything to increase IAP or secretory IgA. It's not going to do anything to uh, stop your mast cells from overreacting to normal foods. And so I think these leaky gut powders were a valiant attempt at the time, but our knowledge of science and our ability to create really, really badass products for people like this has like, we're way past that. Unfortunately, we got to move the market forward and say like, I'm sorry, we can't put it all in one little easy scoop for yeah. you to get better. Um, it's, it's more complex than that. So is it possible that the powders could be part of a program, just not the all in one encompassing program that they're kind of touted to be? Right. Yeah. I think, I think they're, um, like if you want to do them for a couple months, like I don't think it's a bad thing. Like I doubt you're going to hurt yourself, mm -hmm. but if you're not progressing in getting better every like two to three weeks, then you've kind of missed like whatever you're getting from that product, it's no longer what you need. And so right. I think people hold on to ideas for four months, six months, nine months, when in my world, uh, for my own body and for the people I worked with over the last you know decade or more, you should see changes in the gut and your relationship to your symptoms in the environment like every two weeks or so. Like if you're not getting better at you know two, four, six, like there are some things like killing protocols that go 60 days, but I'm, I'm not talking about that specific type of thing. But like in general, if you bring on board a butyrate product and you get slightly better at four weeks, but you're not really any better after that, like that's probably the wrong product or the wrong dosage. And you should revisit that assumption. Smart. Yeah, no, that's good. Good thoughts. What are some of the dietary mistakes that people are making for healing leaky gut? I mean, they're just too, they're just too focused on food. Like if, like if food was the answer, we would have, again, we, it would have been just diet and probiotics and we wouldn't, <laughs> we'd all be talking about, I don't know, losing weight or something. Um, uh, but we're not, we're still talking about gut health. Uh, and, and I would have never gotten here. Okay. Like for the record, I've tried like 40 plus diets. I've designed leaky gut diets in the past. Like the program I sold to tens of thousands of people had a leaky gut diet. It's not that food in and of itself doesn't matter. I'm not saying you can eat cheeseburgers and pizza hut and drink diet Coke all day and fix your gut. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that if you get to a reasonably anti-inflammatory real food diet, um, that's probably good enough if you could handle the other causes of what's happening for you. Instead, we keep searching. We go, we go, you know, uh, paleo, or and then we go autoimmune paleo, and then we go autoimmune paleo minus FODMAPs, and then minus oxalates, and then minus uh, anything with histamine. And it, it's a, it, well, number one, there's a mathematical law on why that's failing. It's called the law of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. If your answer was in that direction, you would be getting better and staying better. But instead, most people eliminate something, feel better for two to four weeks, and then kind of plateau and then start to get worse. And part of the reason is that each one of those eliminations, what is it normally eliminating? It's normally eliminating prebiotic foods yeah. that are needed for butyrate production. And so all this emphasis on uh, food will heal you, food will you know cure you, correct you, not true in my opinion. If it was, how could we have carnivores saying that they've gotten better and vegans? They're, they are opposite ends of the spectrum, but we have success stories from both. And then we have like 80% of both of those communities who are not getting better. And so what that tells us is that food matters, but it doesn't matter. 
Right. Or it matters to your biochemistry. You know, this is where we get the uniqueness and that's really what functional medicine is trying to address. But uh, if now I might be putting you on the spot, but if you had to say, you know, I, this is just to kind of preface this. A lot of people on this right now are listening. They have been on every diet. They have might be on, you know, five different variations of a diet right now, as you just alluded to. What do you do in that situation when that law of diminishing returns is getting, you know, you're, as I like to joke, you know, you pretty soon you're on the air and water diet. When you're approaching that scenario, what do you do? And then what's the reset? And what have you found to be effective as sort of that next step for a what to eat? Because we have to eat. What is it yeah. that you move to at that point? Um, yeah. And for the record, like those are my people, like that's the tough cases are, you know, what I specialize in. And and so I don't want to, it just is my life. And so therefore I end up attracting people that have struggled like me. Um, but yeah, getting down to five foods or, you know, air and water diet is really sad. And it's, it's, it's more of a scary place than a lot of people want to uh, allude to. And so the first step is to, get to a real food diet, a reasonable real food diet of some type that you feel good doing and you can mostly tolerate uh, in your body. And then the second thing is your focus should switch almost completely from food to how are you breaking down that food? So I want you supporting that food with hydrochloric acid or bitters. And I want you using uh, a high end uh, and probably more than what's on the back of the label digestive enzyme because you are better, you have better results typically from what I've seen. You choose the diet you want, but if I can make your stomach acid and your digestive enzymes work perfectly, I can almost guarantee I can get better results than if you continue to eliminate foods and, and go on these special next steps. And so the actual digestibility of the food is the first key for someone in that category making the big breakthrough. And then the second key typically is tributyrin, tributyrin X or some other breakthrough because you have to intervene and we've got to get the mast cells and the histamine and everything. We got to get it to stop expressing and just allow your body to take in these normal nutrients while, you know, healing these five layers. And so you could, you could skip tributyrin and you could use, uh, you know, um, an intervention for each of the five layers if you wanted to design it that way. But the easiest thing that I found is the, the butyrate replacement for a while, while you focus on straight up digestibility of your food. Amazing. Yeah, this is huge. Anything else you want to add to, you know, helping people out right now that, you know, are struggling. Uh, we've touched on a lot today and I think these are massive, massive, uh, you know, tidbits that I think people can take away right away, but is there anything else that you want to suggest, uh, you know, whether or not it's a mistake, a leaky gut healing mistake or not, but any other tidbits we should walk away from? Um, you know, I would say that hopefully I've, I've ruffled your feathers today. Hopefully I've, I've, uh, you know, disagreed with your beliefs a little bit because, Unfortunately, what I find for my own health, as well as for my business, as well as everywhere in my life, and what I find with clients is that the breakthrough that we want in life is typically not in the direction we've already been going for a while. And to make that pivot is typically painful or frustrating or there's fear or some 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 sort of emotion that's not typically pleasure. And so what I mean by that is the dietary thing where you're you go paleo, you feel a little better. You go vegan, you feel a little better. You go carnivore, you feel a little better. You keep, but you keep, you're going down the same dietary path. You're, you're focused on food rather than focusing on like, oh shoot, like maybe there's something wrong with my body mm -hmm. or maybe there's something wrong with my environment. Maybe there's mold in my house. And so the law of diminishing returns and, and getting a breakthrough in health or anything in life typically is stop digging in the direction you're going and go in a different direction that is inspiring or exciting to you. And typically with that pivot, you're going to feel some feelings that are typically fear, anger, frustration, and that's okay. But if you can go through that wall um, and go in a different direction, you're more likely to find a breakthrough than if you continue down whatever functional medicine rabbit hole or whatever dietary rabbit hole you're on. Um, and so I just, I wish people would have explained that kind of thing to me back in the day, because I spent you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars extra in testing and scientific markers that I I'd never needed to run had I just realized that like food was not going to get me all the way there, or mm. you know, killing 
parasites and dysbiosis over and over and over and over and over and over again was never going to get me there. Oh, this is powerful. Thank you so much. Now, where do where do the listeners go to find you online? Uh, healthygut.com is the is the focal point for me at this point. Um, we have articles, we have uh, you know links out to various social sites, and then I you know just search me on the web if you're looking for more you know talks I've done. Well, Stephen, thanks so much for your wisdom today. And I love the ruffling the feathers analogy, but I think honestly, I think it makes a lot of sense in many ways. You know, if you're going down, if you know, if you keep hitting your head against the wall, you've sometimes got to reestablish what you're doing and come back, come at it from a different direction. So thank you for that, uh, that sort of wake up and, uh, and that wisdom today. It's been very powerful. So I really appreciate you being on today. Well, thank you. I hope it's helped. Have a great day. Awesome.